Hey, have you ever lost something and then found it? Is there like a story in your family that's like a legend, the lore of the thing that was lost and then found? Huh? Hey, have you ever lost something and not found it? Huh? Um, this has happened to me. This has happened to you. We've all lost things. Some things we've found. Some things we haven't found. So last, last Sunday, I wasn't here. I was in Des Moines with my son, and I was wearing this blue hoodie. And I, went, I got home after the marathon, and I put the blue hoodie in a pile of clothes, and, and uh, my wife then the next day washed those clothes. And so a few days after that, you know, I didn't see it. I thought I had all my clothes situated, but I didn't, in the back of my head, I didn't see the blue hoodie. And a couple days later, I decided I, I wanted it. I wanted to wear it. It was cold at the end of the week. So my wife wasn't there. I texted her, where's my blue hoodie, which literally translated is, what did you do with my blue hoodie? Where is it? And she replied back and she said, it's, it's in, a, in our bedroom, it's in a basket with some of your folded clothes and it's in our bedroom. So I looked, I mean, I'd already looked. Well, I looked again. I looked through every one of those baskets, not there. It's not here. And I said to my sister, I said to her, it's nowhere in the house. I've looked everywhere in the house, it's gone. It's gone. So I'm thinking in my head, you know, what did my wife do to it? I mean, I don't know what I thought she did with it. Why would she care about my blue hoodie? So the next day or that afternoon or whatever, um, she texts me, your blue hoodie is on the kitchen counter. And she didn't tell me where it was. I didn't really want to ask because I kind of knew. In my bedroom, in one of the baskets, in the folded clothes. Well, you know, when the clothes are folded, you don't want to like unfold them all looking through the basket, right? You want to, you know, keep them there. So anyway, I was glad because the lost had been found. My blue hoodie, and I wore it the other day, and it was all good, and I did have to thank my wife for finding it for me and apologize to her for ever thinking ill of her and my blue hoodie. Um, 15 years ago, 16, 17 years ago, when we moved to Iowa, before we moved here from New York, I bought a new coat. You know, a new, new place, everything was new, and I got a new coat. We, we came in, in January, and this coat was nice because it had one of those vest pockets on the inside, and I could put my, my PDA in there, my Sony Clie. Anybody ever have a Sony Clie? Anyone? Come on, help me. Help me. One hand. One hand. Oh, thank you, Darren. He didn't, but he just didn't want me to be up here by myself. So the Sony Clie, right, the Palm Pilot with a little... So, I had it in there and somehow I went to get my coat one day and it wasn't in the closet. And I thought, well, it's going to turn up. I, I probably just went somewhere and hung it up and I, I'll find it. 17 years later, I have no idea whatever happened to that coat or that Sony Clie, which at the time was fairly expensive. Both of those items were. And somebody, I suppose, used them. Nobody's using the Sony anymore. That's way outdated. Maybe somebody's still wearing my coat, but the lost was never found. I never found it. Now, there's the jury is still out on something else. My AirPods. How many of you have AirPods? Apple AirPods? You know, I'm shocked. The first service, there was like two people. You guys haven't lived. How many of you have wireless earbuds? Just wireless. Oh, people aren't living in this room. You got to get wireless earbuds and you can do stuff. You don't have that wire hanging down and, and you could be busy and you could do three things at once. They're lost. Two weeks ago today, they come in that little white chiclet box. Two weeks ago today, they're lost. Somebody after the first service said, hey, you can get on and you can find them with your iPhone. The, uh, good knowing now, but the battery's, I'm sure, dead. And it says it do doesn't come up. So I want them. Why do I want them? Well, they're valuable. They cost a lot of money. They're special to me because my kids gave them to me for, as a Christmas gift last Christmas. I might have suggested that. And I just want them with me because when they're with me, I can use them. Usually I have my keys. I have my phone and I have my AirPod case in my left pocket. It's become standard operating procedure for me. And I can't find it. I can't find it. So this morning, you're going to see where this is going. 
We, we want the lost to be found, right? It's, it's exciting. I hope that on a future Sunday, I could stand before you and say, I found the AirPods. I found them. And you will rejoice with me, right? You'll be happy for me. When the lost is found, there's rejoicing. And you know where this is going. So here's what I want to tell you this morning. When we see people the way Jesus does, we will treat them the way he did. When we see them the way Jesus does, we'll treat them the way he did. Special, valuable, and people that he desires to be around. I mean, if I can think that way about my AirPods, because they're special to me, my kids gave them to me, they're valuable, they're expensive, and I just want them with me, seems to me they're the same things that Jesus says about people, is that they're special to him, he paid for their sins, they're valuable, the Father gave them to him, and he just wants us with him. He wants to be around us, and he wants us to be around him. In Luke chapter 5, Jesus talks about calling this guy named Levi, or Matthew, one of his disciples. When it happened that he told Matthew to come and follow me, in Luke chapter 5 and verse 27, it says, later, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up, he left everything, and he followed him. Later, look what happens. Later, Levi held a banquet at his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. And many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. But the Pharisees and their teachers of religious law, they complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples, why do you eat and drink with such scum? That's how the religious leaders saw these people. That's how they saw the tax collectors who were mostly going to be Jews working for the Roman Empire. That's how they saw their friends who were likely going to be friends of the Jewish tax collectors. They saw them as scum. They saw them as people who aligned themselves with the Roman Empire and who essentially then would turn their back on the religious power structure of the day. The religious leaders saw them as scum. Who do you and I see as scum? Wow, that's uncomfortable, isn't it? <laughs> we want to say, we don't see anybody as scum. I do sometimes. I'm ashamed to say. And in the last probably 10, 15 years, as I've been teaching more and more and more from the life of Christ and about the love of God for people, I notice when I look at people with malintent in my eyes or, or in my heart. And I say to myself, I've often, often said to myself, wow, Jesus loves them. He doesn't look at them the way I'm looking at them right now. And I say to myself, how do I not look at them this way? They're different than me. They're, I can just tick it off. They're less than me here. They're less than me there. They're less than me here. And I don't think very highly sometimes. And I say to myself, how can I see people the way that Jesus saw people so that I'll treat them the way Jesus did? Well, there he was with Matthew. There he was with Levi. He was in his home. There was a banquet. There were all of the tax collector's friends. And there he was. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they couldn't figure it out. Why would he hang around such scum? Last week, John Dunwell, as he shared, he said this, if we really want to be like Jesus, we're going to need to be a part of the best parties in our community. John was poking at you guys. Did you feel it? Did you feel the poke? He was saying, we got to go out and party. You were like, ooh, Christians don't party. You know, turn a phrase, right? Yes, Christians have to be out with people, real people. The found have to go out and spend time with those who need to be found, right? That's how people get found. God, Jesus, always works through his body 
the church in the life of the world to bring more people to be a part of his body, the church. Two weeks ago, I said this, creating space in our lives to build relationships with those who live near us must become a priority. So last week, John used the term margins. And on my paper, I have white space around the corners and in the middle. And sometimes on my notes, I'll use the margins to write my notes in. Sometimes I don't have enough room. A couple pages, I've got it, and I start, you start writing really smaller as you get down, and then you get to the corner, and you think, do you go over? But if I go over, I'm going to be talking, and I'm not going to be looking at it, and we need margin, right? We need margin. If, if this had no margins, and these covered the whole thing, and I wanted to write a note, I have no, have you ever done that before? You want to make a note on something, and there's no, so what do you do? You go like this, you turn it over. Oh, and you're hoping there's not anything on the other side, right? And when there's a white piece of paper on the other side, you're like, oh, you can breathe again. You got some white space and you can, you can write bigger because you've got a lot of room and a lot of space and a lot of thoughts can get downloaded on the paper. In our lives, John was talking about this book called Margins by Richard Swenson. He says you've got to build margin into your life, and that's what we have to do if we're going to develop relationships with other people, and if we're going to truly see people the way Jesus did. When Jesus saw people with need, he walked through the margins of his life, and he moved toward them. He had time. He had time, and he had margin in his heart and in his soul for people. So again, when we see people the way Jesus does, we'll treat them the way that he did. Now there's a real interesting passage of scripture. We were just in Luke 5 with Matthew. In Luke 15, 10 chapters later, it says this in verse one. It says, again, here we go again, tax collectors and other notorious sinners. By the way, today I'm using the New Living Translation. I always use the NIV, but today is the NLT the New Living Translation, just to change it up. And just so that uh, I needed to read this in a different, in a different uh, version. So tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. And Luke wrote this. By the way, Luke wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts. Part one, part two. Uh, a record of the life of Jesus, a record of the life of the church. And he was very voluminous in his writings. In fact, if you take those two books and you pile them together, there's more words and sentences in Luke's writings than there are in all of Paul's epistles. Luke actually wrote most of the New Testament. So he carefully researched this and he makes this statement that tax collectors who are notorious sinners and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. So Jesus attracted the rabble, the riffraff, (laughs) right? It's what we were, right? Jesus attracted regular people. Why? He actually cared about them. They could sense that he actually respected them enough to care about them. Going on, verse 2, this made the Pharisees, guys like me and teachers of religious law, complain that he was associating with such sinful people. Ew, even eating with them, eating with people in that day meant that you're aligning yourself. You are You are almost covenanting together as two people when you sat and shared a meal together. When you were invited into somebody's home and you were eating with them, that, that was a very intimate thing. I'm not sure what would be synonymous today with that. Almost going into partnership with somebody else on a project or a business, uh, uh, some kind of a cooperative. Because today, we can eat in somebody's home. It doesn't mean quite what it meant back then. Back then, it meant even more. And they were like appalled that he would, ew, he would even be eating with such people. So, verse 3, Jesus told them this story. In fact, Jesus then told them three stories about a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. Now, you'd be familiar with these stories. We hear these stories a lot. We think they're just nice stories for Sunday school or whatever, right? 
make a, make a, a Veggie Tales movie out of them or something. But Jesus told these stories in response to religious leaders who looked down on the riffraff scum of the day. They put themselves up here and looked at people down here. That never happens today, right? Never happens in our society where you've got the, the ones up here and the ones down here. And of course, we're all, we're all right here, right? We're all in the middle. None of us are up here. None of us are down here because we're not comfortable being in those places. So we all kind of put ourselves here until we compare ourselves with somebody else and then we put ourselves up here as long as nobody knows we're putting ourselves up here because it's only in our wicked heart that we're doing it and looking at everybody else down here. Okay, so Jesus tells three stories to speak to the Pharisees. The first one, beginning in verse four of chapter 15, he talks about a lost sheep. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? You've heard this story before. Perhaps you've heard about, what about the 99? What does it say about their safety and all this stuff? But that's, that's beside the point. That's getting outside of what the story is about. The story is about the one that's gotten away. Verse five, when he has found it, He's left the 99, he's gone after the one. When he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. Joyfully. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me because I've found my lost sheep. And will they rejoice? Yes, because a sheep was valuable. Valuable. Any kind of livestock in that day was valuable. And he finds the lost sheep. Now, there's 99, right? You could just let that one go. But, but the point wasn't how many he had left. The point was all about the one that was lost. So I don't see them in here. Are the mains in here this morning? I talked about them this morning. Oh, excuse me. There, all better. Um, they're not in here. They have eight children. The mains do. Curtis and Rachel. Let's say one of them wanders off and gets lost. You think they're gonna leave the seven and go looking for the one? Yes, they're gonna leave the seven and go looking for the one. In fact, some of the seven are gonna come with them to help them look for the one. And when they find that one, they're gonna rejoice, they're gonna be happy, they're gonna throw a party. Why, because the loss has been found. So look at verse seven, Luke 15. In the same way, Jesus says, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over the 99 others who are righteous in heaven straight away. So Jesus with, was with all the lost ones. And the Pharisees were like, what is he doing? And he's like, no, when, you, when they're found, there's even more joy than for the you 99 that are already over there. In, in 1993, my wife and I, after church one morning, we were there for a while and most people were gone and we're kind of gathering our two kids together to go home. We lived across the street. And where's Joel? Joel was two years old and we couldn't find him. We went looking in the rooms downstairs with the kids' department and stuff. And we, it wasn't that big of a church and we couldn't find him. And we kept looking and one minute turned into two and turned into three and anxiety level started to increase. You know how it is when your kid is missing. We couldn't find him. I think one of us went back across the street to our house thinking, did he, go, did he wander over to the house? We still couldn't find him. And then somebody said this. Somebody said, now most everybody's gone now, but there's people left and they're, they're helping us look. Somebody said, hey, there was a strange guy in the service this morning. Did anybody see that guy leave? Oh my word. We were just like seized with panic and fear. I remember walking out of the back of the church into the parking lot and seeing some people from our church walking up and down the sidewalks calling, Joel, Joel. And when that happened, I'm like, oh my goodness, my son is gone. And just about when we were like ready to just like fall apart, I, I bet it was 10 minutes. I bet it was 10 minutes, which every minute seems like an eternity, right? When your two-year-old is missing. Here comes the senior pastor holding Joel. What did Joel do? He went to the downstairs, he went to the end of the hall, 
and he went through this little entryway here, and then he went down there. He's basically down underneath, under the, under the pulpit area, and there's a closet down there. He, got, and he went into that closet, he sat down, he put his back against the closet. Everything's dark in there. He's playing hide and seek. He and Alyssa were gonna play hide and seek. So he went to hide, and somehow the pastor had the presence of mind to look in there and brought him out. Now, Debbie and I were way more thrilled about seeing Joel than about Alyssa, who had always been with us. I mean, yeah, of course we love Alyssa. It's fine. But Joel, we found him. We were way more excited about finding him. And again, he says, in the same way, there's more joy in heaven. Now, Jesus is telling the Pharisees this. What's the lesson here? Think about this. Why are you hanging out with these scum? There's more joy in heaven over the one lost than all of those that have been found. He tells two more stories. Look at the next one. It's about the lost coin. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it like I did with a flashlight under the seats of my two vehicles two nights ago? I mean, move the seat all the way forward, look under, move it all the way back, look under. I'm down on my hands and knees. I'm looking for my AirPods. I never found them. But verse 9, when she finds it, she will call... She will call in her friends and neighbors and say, rejoice with me because I found my lost coin. Here it is again. In the same way, there is joy, joy, joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. Notice how Jesus is associating joy and rejoicing with what and who the religious leaders call scum. It's upside down. It's a little bit different. It's a 180 from the way the religious leaders see the people. Why? Because Jesus sees people differently. He sees them as special and as valuable and as to be desired. He wants people. So again, the next time you see people that are a little skewered from your liking, think about it. Jesus is looking for them. He wants to find them. He wants them to find him. And then verse 11, Luke writes, to illustrate the point further, (laughs) if you haven't gotten it yet, I got even a better story for you. We won't read the whole thing because you know this one. But the beginning of it is this very telling. Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed up all his belongings and moved to a different land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. He lived the life of the proverbial fool. He took all of his money, he lived for today, for tomorrow I die, and he spent it all. And you know the story. He ends up feeding pigs as his job, wanting to eat the very food that he was giving his pigs. Not his pigs, the guy he was working for, who was probably paying him squat. And all of a sudden, oh, he could have had a V8. He remembered the servants at my father's house. The servants, they eat fine. They're not like this. I know what I'll do. I'll just go back. I'll just go back and become a servant. Then at least I've got something to eat. And you know the story, he goes back, his father's waiting for him, gives him a hug, rings on his fingers, bells on his toes. Has anybody seen my sweet gypsy rose? I mean, it was wonderful. They, they, they killed the fatted calf and they had a big party. And who was out in the field? The fairest, uh, no, no, the older brother. The older brother, bitter jealous, resentful, not wanting to come in out of the field. Why? Verse 28, the older brother was angry. He was angry. What in the world? He does this to you? He does, you did this to my father? You expect to come back in? Nobody would expect that, right? We would have been the same way if we were the older brother. You ran off and you squandered it. You get, you... Lie in the bed you made. But Jesus is teaching a lesson here. How do you see people? 
How does God see people? So his father said to him in verse 31, look, dear son, you've always stayed by me. And that's wonderful. We're not talking about that, though. And everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he's found. That's the whole point. The lost is found. Two things that I see here is that Jesus enjoys hanging out with ordinary people who are also sinners. You know, they got mad because they said, Jesus is hanging around sinners. That was all there was. We're all sinners. Who did we want him to hang around? He hung around ordinary people that were sinners. You know, I told the story in the first service that I once talked to Kobe Bryant. I spoke to him. He spoke to me. We looked at each other in the eye. We fist bumped. Kobe Bryant. Some of you are like, who's Kobe Bryant? That's all right. Only the We couldn't figure out if he was the second, third, or maybe now fourth best ever NBA basketball player, right? He, some years ago, fourth, okay. Probably lower, you don't have that many fingers, right? Some years ago, I mean, he was like, he was it in the NBA world. But you know what? He's just a guy. Some of you, we live in Iowa, some of you have sat with presidents, right? You've met presidents, you've shaken their hand. They're just guys, right? Just people, ordinary people, sinners, all. Doesn't matter. Jesus had nobody else to hang out with. But he enjoys hanging out with ordinary people who are also sinners. He enjoys it. He talked about joy and rejoicing and being happy as he told those stories. Jesus gets truly joyful and happy when lost people find him. So my question to us this morning is how do we see people? Especially the least of these. We didn't even go to Matthew 25, right? Whatever you do for the least of these, you do for me. How do we see people? And if we could somehow see our way clear to seeing people the way Jesus sees them, then we'll feel about them the way he feels about them and we'll treat them the way he treated them. So last week you got these, a couple weeks ago, these Who Is My Neighbor cards. By the way, there's more on those tables. You saw them probably on your way in. How are you doing on that? If I checked your, if I checked your, uh, your online account for school, what would that show that assignment? Like you were supposed to fill in Fill in all these, the eight closest neighbors. How are we doing? If, if you've not done yet, you're going to get 10% off the grade on this. So you have to finish it by next week. You've got a week now. What if, you, what if your life depended on it? You really only had a week. You'd get it done. So let's get it done, huh? Let's get it done. Let's, let's find the eight closest neighbors. The only assignment was write their first and last names down. That was it. That was it. You didn't even have to talk to them. You can look it up online if you need to. Just write their first and last name down. And then the next assignment is going to be to use that first name. Like, for instance, if the name was Shirley, I might walk up to her and say, you know what I'm going to say. Hi, Shirley. Like, you could do that. That would be pretty easy. So I have an idea for the month of November. It's called thank you dinners. Thank you dinners. What if if we had, as a church family, what if we all had thank you dinners at our homes? can be as big or as little, could be a thank you snack, right? Here's what thank you dinners could be. Inviting two to four neighborhood families for a meal, telling them why you're thankful to have them as neighbors, and then have everyone share three things that day. They don't even have to know that they're having to share three things. It could just be conversation starters. And here are the three things. Share something you're thankful for in your life. This is just conversation around the table. Tell about someone you are thankful for. Not something, but now someone. And then share or describe something about Newton that you are thankful for. What if all of us as families in the church invited some neighbors around into our home and just talked about being thankful? It's cultural. It's not religious even. It's very spiritual and very biblical. Give thanks to the Lord always, right? But it's just cultural. 
It's Thanksgiving time. November is the month of Thanksgiving. Have a thank you party. Have a thank you dinner. Invite people over and just talk about being thankful. It's an icebreaker to connect you to neighbors. We have to be connected to our neighbors. So what do you do? You pray, you invite, and you invest. You pray about who to invite, you invite them, and then when they come over, you just invest. You just spend time and just invest with them. Man, you know what's a lot harder? Actually following Jesus, okay? So this is a low bar. Somebody said the other day that the bar is gonna be so low that you you have to step over it. You can't even go under it, right? Um, This is a low bar. Pray, invite, and invest. The month of November is coming up. It's coming up. So be thinking about it. You've got a lot of time. And we'll give you little cards that just tell you what to do, just little quick cards. And maybe we even will make some cards that you can share with a neighbor. Invite them over. They just like when you go to the dentist, right? They tell you when to come back, when to pay your money, I mean, what time you're supposed to come back, uh, when your appointment is. You can do that. You can give it to them. When we see people the way Jesus does, we will treat them the way Jesus did. Special, valuable, desirable. Won't it be exciting some Sunday when I come up and I say, I found my AirPods, and you will rejoice with me. You'll be happy, and I'll be happy. Wouldn't it be nice if we came up and said somebody found Jesus or Jesus found somebody? Somebody who was far from God came back to God. Wouldn't that be exciting? Why does it somehow, in our culture, in our way, you know, we're kind of used to the church, we're kind of used to our family right here, we're kind of, we're okay with just getting together every Sunday, we're okay with having a lot of people that never come? Why is that? How can we turn that around? How can our heart break for the people who are far from God? How can we be way more excited about finding people for God than about finding our lost money or wallet or, or phone? That would be one we should have talked about, right? How many of you have lost your phone or your diamond ring or whatever it is? Can we get more excited about people? Well, we'll talk about that in the future. Let's pray together. God, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for these three stories that illustrate to us how you think and how you feel about people. Lord, we pray that you would help us to feel and think and act toward people the way that you do, the way that you do, that we would honor people the way you honored us. Help us to do that, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. I wanna invite the people to come up that are going to be sharing communion with you all this morning. And um, I wanna tell you that when you come up, I want you to think about Jesus on the cross and the people that would have been in front of him. I don't know who they were, how many there were, if they were passing by. When he was on the cross, bleeding and dying, how did he see the people in front of him? I know how I would have seen them. I would have thought pretty badly of each and every one of them. How did Jesus see them? So when you come this morning, the bread represents the body of Christ, the body of Christ that was given for you, put on the cross for you and me, for our sins. And the juice, the blood of Jesus. We could go back into the Old Testament. I would be thrilled to, but time to go. Time to move on with the service. The sacrificial system talks about the blood and how how Jesus becomes the lamb and how his blood, like in the Exodus, his blood gets sprinkled on the door frame and the doorposts of our lives so that death and hell passes by us and so that we can be saved and enter the promised land. It's, it all fulfilled, found its fulfillment on the cross. It found its fulfillment in exactly what we're remembering today, the suffering Savior, the body and blood of Jesus. Lord, as we take this bread and this juice, we remember that you paid for our sin through pain, through suffering, and through death. 
and we're thankful to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, I invite you to come up and just rip a little bit of bread off, dip it in the juice, and take it. And remember Jesus and be thankful. You can come.